Hey, what's going on in this uh, post 2020 world? Everybody, there are so many different online businesses to choose from to select if you're interested in doing an online business, um, you know, as a side hustle, um, semi passively or passively, anything like that. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about something that I've got tons of experience with. I've actually been doing them since 2005. What is it? We're going to talk about launching a short and medium term rental um, or you know launching just a single rental or, or launching a rentals business I've got a lot of experience with doing it my particular experience is um, you know really for properties that um, I own and already owned and then I kind of furnished and moved out of and then also um, helping friends with um, well you know falling into situations where I, I helped friends with their rentals and launching them on Airbnb and then also family members, but everything from, um, you know, skiing resorts in Lake Tahoe in Colorado, all the way to a lot of it is here in Southern California. So what is really appealing um, about this business in terms of launching a short and medium term rental is that really anybody can do it, right? Um, and the reason I say that is because if you think about you know, getting a rental, it's, it's really been around since arguably, um, the beginning of organized society, even as like a kid before you're 18, I remember, you know, kind of looking around and trying to get a rental for, you know, beach week or something like that when I was 17 or, or spring break and everybody was, you know, in high school, high school friends were, were going. So, um, pretty much anybody can do it. Um, and again, it's been around since, uh, arguably the beginning of organized society. So obviously way before Airbnb showed up, but for the spirit of this, uh, put, particular presentation, um, I'm going to be talking about launching a, a, a furnished rental. And what that will be in is that will be um, rentals that you'll rent uh, on a short and medium term basis. So when I say short, um, I mean, I guess medium term is really typically 30 days or longer, um, you know, usually not longer than, than six months. Um, but a lot of times um, there are a lot of rentals that can be um, that can be acquired at 30 days. And then also there's going to be a lot of markets that actually don't allow short term rentals anymore. But having said that, that there still is a great opportunity um, to rent a particular property for 30 days or longer, um, you know, with Airbnb uh, and VRBO, who are kind of like the really the Pepsi and the Coke, you know, if you will, of, of the top rental sites. But there's lots of others um, that you can choose from as well, and I'm going to get into that today. As well. so, as we um, you know launch here this this video, uh, basically there's a lot of things to consider with respect to your strategy. You know, um, what sort of rental are you going to do? What's the market? You know, what is the strategy that is really appealing to you. But as I kind of launch and talk about all this, um, let's do a, a quick intro, okay? Okay, so welcome. Um, and this is uh, here, I'm going to uh, talk about how I escaped the nine to five grind uh, and generate $30,000 plus months uh, as a short and medium term rental host through Airbnb uh, and VRBO and how you can too. Um, you know, some some of these references do talk about um, rental arbitrage, but uh, what I can tell you is that this whole launch is, we're not going to focus too much on uh, rental arbitrage. It's just going to be more about rentals itself. Um, in case you're not familiar, uh, rental arbitrage is when you go and you rent a property and then you then sublease it, re-rent it out uh, on Airbnb and VRBO. Um, one thing that's great about that is that you could get a couple of those going um, and then you could start to, um, you know, start to to see some pretty, pretty attractive scale, right? Um, okay. So a uh, short uh, and medium term rental arbitrage could be a top investment. How and why short and medium term property rentals that you uh, could be one of the top investment in modern times, um, how to find the best property rentals for you, how you can get the best possible rental deal, how to implement property management systems, which enable you to be remote, semi-passive, um, you know, uh, I, I don't really know if fully passive is, is possible, but, you know, certainly could go semi-passive. Um, and then some experience hack, which can lift your returns, which really we talk, um, I'm not going to cover too much of business credit, but the concept of, of when it comes to, to launching a rental, uh, the concept of credit can be, you know, relatively important. So a little bit of a background on me, everybody. Um, you know, I'm just going <laughs> to refer to myself as, uh, you know, Johnny SoCal Rental Guy. I mean, that's kind of, you know, some one of the emails that I have and how I, I refer to myself here in this particular presentation. Um, I've actually have a pretty deep background as an online entrepreneur. I've launched three online businesses, all of them up to seven figures per year plus and certainly beyond. Um, during the Great Recession, 2008, 2012, I started renting my Southern California properties on VRBO and Airbnb, and they did extremely well. Um, so I certainly I certainly moved out of them and I turned a you know vacation rental into um, into a full on rental, right? Um, and then I'll, and then moved out of the, the loft that I had. So the both of the, the two of them together really made a pretty darn decent uh, salary. Actually, um, I'm about to share with you a lot of the secrets, uh, plus give you the tools you need to enable you to confidently launch and fund 
your, um, you know, Fender rental. Okay, so this is also, this is one of my rentals right here. Uh, as you can see, beautiful sunset. Um, and then here we have uh, our presentation for you. What is gonna be the most important thing to do is to gonna be to, for you to establish your rental strategy. And what do I mean by that? Well, the fact is, is everybody's gonna have different interests, right? So you're gonna have, you know, situations like, like for example, people that, you know, just wanna rent their place for like a month or two a year so they can kind of cover some bills or pay for the bills or pay for even part of the bills of the property. Then you're gonna have people that wanna do rental arbitrage and they wanna get, you know, multiple properties going on rental arbitrage or you have a situation where like me where um, I was actually uh, living in a, um, a, a, a kind of a house about an hour away from Los Angeles and I wanted to move back to Los Angeles and I'd already furnished it and um, I wanted to start you know I wanted to keep the actual vacation property use it for myself but also have it monetize some so whatever the situation is you know you got to figure out what that's going to be for yourself I'm presuming that the majority of people that are watching this video are most interested in this as a business so they're going to want to maximize revenue so the majority of this presentation is going to be geared towards maximizing revenue having said that there are going to be a lot of um, strategies uh, you know with respect to the way that you kind of um, you know can gear towards a, a 30 night rental or more that are really helpful for uh, people that don't necessarily want to maximize the revenue and they also want to you know maximize the revenue while also having some some um, some slots for them to stay in. So um, for some people, uh, they're going to be really limited by uh, money and cash and credit, uh, which is fine because um, in those situations, um, what people do is called co-hosting, which is basically you just, you can help uh, another host that actually owns the property or is running the property. You can help them manage by doing co-hosting. Um, and then there's also partnering, right? So for example, if you, you know, are brand new at it and you want to go do a rental arbitrage, you want to go, you know, find a place, you need to go rent it, you could go and get a partner. That way, you know, obviously you would be splitting the costs associated with uh, everything for launching the rental. Um, so that's partnering. And then the, then there's also rental arbitrage, which is where, um, you know, obviously you'd go in and, and rent a place um, and then, you, you know, find a, a proper location and then you would rent it out, you know, through, um, you know, short and medium term rentals, through Airbnb and you know, various other sites. In any case, what you want to do um, at this point, if you've selected uh, that you're going to be, to be doing co-hosting uh, or you're going to be partnering, that's fine. But if you are going to be doing your own rental arbitrage, uh, in any case, what you want to do is you want to go and get a pre-approval is going to be uh, certainly very helpful for you because it's going to give you some sort of a guide in terms of what you can afford. And understanding what you can afford is going to be crucial at every stage of the game. Once you have um, decided on your uh, rental strategy, and then you kind of have a little bit of a handle on what you can afford, you know, whether that's with a partner um, and not assuming co-hosting or rental arbitrage, you want to go ahead and choose a market. So when we go and choose a market, um, what a, a great site to use for this is called AirDNA. Uh, what you can do with AirDNA is you can uh, you know research uh, and find a location uh, that has a sufficient travel demand. Basically, what's fun about this is you can design a pro forma for expected annual revenue and factor in rent. So for example, um, this particular location is a very interesting area called Murrieta. Uh, and with a Murrieta, basically, you know, AirDNA is projecting this particular property to do about 97200 And then the, uh, the rent, as you can see from Zillow, is actually 3300 So if you do the quick math on that, that's actually a $4,800 a month gross profit. Again, that's just gross revenues with, with gross rent. There's going to be a few expenses inside of that as well. But in any case, if you take, um, so, so really doing the quick math for you, as you can see, 97,200 divided by 12, you know, that's 8,100 minus 3,300. That's 4,800. Uh, you know, that is a, basically a 60% gross profit margin level, which is very, very attractive. So then if you take those numbers though, and then you take that 4,800 and then you multiply it times 12, that's 57,600 of yearly gross profit, you know, so obviously 60, you know, I think, I don't know about you all, but when in, in, in taking a look at businesses, you know, really any business out there at 60% gross profit is a very good business, right? So this, you know, one particular 
um, example that I chose uh, is is a, a yearly gross profit of about fifty seven thousand six hundred. If you were to rent the property for thirty three hundred and then you know rent it out, uh, you know uh, on short term rentals through Airbnb, VRBO, and other short term rental sites. The thing with what's interesting about Murrieta is is uh, I do know I have a little familiarity with it, and um, in that particular area they do allow short term rentals. You have to get a permit to do it. But in any case, whatever the market is that you're looking at um, and that you're thinking about and that you ultimately choose, obviously, you're going to have to, to research all of the uh, the laws and the regulations. You know, if you can't, you know, it's still worth it to do, um, you know, 30 day rentals. But at the same time, um, it, it might be, at least in this day and age, a better bet to actually be in an area where you can do Airbnb and VRBO and do um, rentals for less than 30 days so that you can do that during, you know, more peak season, which is, let's say, you know, April all the way to September, right? So what's really interesting about this particular market is this market is uh, in the Temecula Valley, which is about an hour and, you know, depending on traffic and, and such, but an hour to an hour and a half, about an hour and a half outside of Los Angeles, as well as, you know, an hour to an hour and a half outside of uh, Orange County and San Diego. So, you know, this particular kind of market is a little bit different. It is also is a wine country. So people are going to go there for that, uh, of course. Um, but what is great about those markets is again they're not the you know they're not the city of Los Angeles or Orange County or San Diego so your rents are going to be your rents in terms of what you rent on Zillow from are typically on average going to be a lot lower so if you can find um, you know a location like this where you go into air DNA and you see that really attractive revenue and then you see oh wow well the market for long-term unfurnished rental is actually much lower that's a great arbitrage opportunity uh, you know right there you know what's interesting thing about these locations too is that you know when you get to a point where at some point even if you have multiple arbitrage rental arbitrages you know you're you're going to want to most likely own a place at some point. Um, and these particular areas are uh, also can potentially be, you know, an appealing, uh, an appealing area to own because, you know, uh, the, the property values might not be as high, obviously. So your cost of acquisition is going to be lower. But when you actually do the shorter rentals, you can make quite a bit more money. So now that you have a better sense for choosing your market, um, the next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to take a look at demand and competition. So what that means is you want to take a look, obviously, um, at, you know, once you've honed in on this market, you want to take a look at um, you know comparable properties and how their calendar looks. So what I can say is uh, at the time of this video, um, it's basically early 2024. You know, it, it seems fair to say that uh, you know, Airbnb has gotten certainly um, a lot more competitive. There is a lot of supply uh, out there. I mean, if you think about the reality of how much more supply there is. Um, than before, like let's say 2019, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. There's a lot of choices. So for example, you know, it's going to be um, quite a bit easier for someone that's a traveler to find a place. Um, and it's going to be um, quite a bit more difficult, you know, just speaking about Airbnb in terms of standing out with your property. But that's okay because there's a lot of other, you know, sites that you can use besides, uh, besides Airbnb. It's just that in this day and age, you can't really kind of, it's kind of hard to get away with not using Airbnb. So in terms of looking at the calendar, um, you know, with respect to demand and competition, what you want to do is like, for me, again, I'm somebody that, you know, I've kind of, I feel like I can do a lot of this stuff, you know, at the back of my hand. I mean, businesses always change and you always have to keep up and, you know, it, it's not easy. You've always got to be on your game, right? But at the same time, um, I can say that uh, normally I don't prefer to take bookings much more than like three months out. Right. So with respect to uh, Airbnb, you can as a host, you can specify, uh, you know, the maximum uh, amount of time your window, right, your booking window, the maximum amount of time um, as three months. So a lot of hosts on Airbnb, at least me and my experience myself, I prefer to not allow bookings more than three months out. With VRBO though, the tightest window you can go is six months. So what that means is that anybody that's a host on VRBO, you know, you, you can't really um, specify a window less than six months. So here we are January, you know, at, at this point, I mean, people could theoretically be booking for July, um, you know, for, uh, you know, on, on, for the property. But in any case, what, what I'm getting at is when you're looking at uh, the competitive calendar, uh, most people are booking out, you know, around, you know, one to two months, right? So you, you know, you'd want to see like how the, the property looks this month and next month. And that's what you want to, um, that's what you want to take a look at in terms of demand and competition. And then obviously you can see a lot from that. You're going to be able to see, you know, what their rates are, 
You're also going to be able to see, you know, one of the most important things uh, that we're going to get into next um, is going to be, you know, the property size and, and the features, right? Um, because property size is going to, you know, play a huge role in, in, in how much money that you can earn from your rental. But the point is, is that are you looking at a one bedroom, you know, or are you looking at a two and three bedroom house? Uh, obviously, the more bedrooms that you can that you can get in terms of, you know, your property that you're going to launch, it, 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 the more money that you're going to make. So as you look at uh, the calendar uh, and you look at, uh, you know, competition and demand, you want to make sure that you're looking at the appropriate months, right? So for example, you're going to see different seasonal pricing. Like if you look at, you know, certainly, obviously, depending on where the location of the property is, if you were talking about the Sun Belt, like, you know, Southern California, you know, Florida and, and the warmer areas, um, you, you're, you're going to see different pricing from, let's say, um, you know, April all the way to September versus, uh, you know, October all the way till April. But if you're talking, you know, it's a different situation when you're looking at a, um, you know, a rental that that is some like at a, at a ski resort or, or some sort of a mountain, right? You know, what you want to do is as you look at competition, you're going to blend that with what you look at with respect to air DNA. And, you know, it's going to be important that you come up with some sort of a conservative number, which is a very conservative and reasonable, um, you know, figure for an average so that you can factor in profitability because obviously you want to make sure that, you know, you're going to be profitable with, um, with your rent. In terms of property size, as we've discussed, it's going to be very, uh, crucial and important that you, uh, you know, figure out how many bedrooms. I mean, the, the fact is, is that the more bedrooms you can get, the better, right? So if you can go into an area, you know, like some of the areas that I just showed you, which is, you know, an hour outside of Los Angeles or an hour and a half outside of Los Angeles, and you can get a place that's, you know, four or five bedrooms, that's going to be, you know, larger groups and you can, you know, factor in your pricing, you know, because it's going to be larger groups. So you're going to be able to, uh, you know, make more money. Um, the other thing to consider is, you know, pool. So are you going to be able to get a place with a pool and a hot tub? So if there's a pool and a hot tub, obviously those are going to be features that people are really going to seek out. Um, my one uh, property about an hour and a half in, um, you know, East of Los Angeles has a pool and, you know, it's pretty, uh, overwhelming the amount of people that want to rent the property because of the pool and certainly the hot tub. There's also some other basic features that you, you know, want to think about and you have to figure out like the basics of, you know, having a washer and a dryer um, and then how, um, how the kitchen is set up, basically how big the kitchen is and everything that, you know, you have to make available with the kitchen. You know, at a place where you've got the demand and competition figured out, you've figured out your rental strategy, you kind of have a, a good sense for, you know, what it looks like from a revenue perspective and a cost perspective. You've got a good sense for what the property size and the features look like. Where are we at right now? It's time to make an offer. You want to go ahead and grab your pre-approval. Uh, obviously, you've got your pre-approval. And now is actually a good time to consider uh, speaking to a real estate agent. So you don't have to use a real estate agent, but it is really kind of nice to have a real estate agent because real estate agents can be very helpful in terms of um, establishing connections with all sorts of service people, You know, whether that's a general contractor uh, or it's a landscaper or it's a pool person or, uh, you know, there's the reality is is that there can be a lot of different service people I can tell you you know again my house um, where I have where I do rentals you know there'll be any given day where we're getting it ready for a, a warm weather rental and I mean there's like literally five people working at the house and then there's the HVAC you know service people that are coming over for the AC there is the carpet cleaners that are coming over to clean the carpet there uh, and they're also cleaning the tile there's the pool guy coming to do the pool I mean there's a lot of service people you know and that's in addition to the five people that are there doing different things, you know, related to um, just getting the house ready. So the real estate agent is also going to be very helpful in terms of making your offers, right? Um, so, uh, you know, all the offers that you make, you know, whether you, know, you make one offer and you're good to go or you make multiple, uh, the real estate agent is going to be very helpful in helping you make um, it's, they're also going to be very helpful in understanding your contracts. Um, for example, you know, if you make an offer and your offer is accepted, you know, whether it's a purchase or a rental, I mean, typically there's a few days, which is escrow for things to kind of finalize. Right. So the, you know, real estate agent, if you understand, you know, will help you with the contracts and you can understand if, you know, whatever money you put into as a deposit, you know, if you can actually recover that, if things, you know, um, if things don't pan out to your satisfaction with respect 
kept to um, escrow. Uh, in general, um, escrow uh, quite often can last about 30 days. That's the general time frame. Um, it can be quicker than that, or it can be you know longer than that. But in general, that's a, a, around the typical time frame is about 30 days. Okay, so since you've established your rental strategy, you figured out the competition, you figured out the property, you made an offer, and maybe you've gotten an offer. You've received an accepted offer, um, and you close. So let's say that you know you're again. This could be you know a purchase or or a rental. Um, it's going to be time to prepare your property. So when it comes time to prepare your property, this could be you know anything from extensive renovations to you know really light renovations. I think you know. Um, presuming that you did a purchase, uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the most basic is, uh, you know, redoing paint and carpet, right? Uh, but basically there are going to be some things that you, um, that you may want to do in terms of preparing the property. It's also uh, going to be time to apply for and get any necessary permits that you may need. Uh, so in terms of some of the renovations, I mean, you know, that could be an, an endless, uh, you know, kind of an endless uh, list of things, right? But basically, if I as I look back, uh, and I one of my rentals, I started getting it going again in 2014. Um, you know, uh, over the years, and you can also do kind of like a, a core. Um, you know, you can do a core, not really remodel, but you know, whatever touches you want to do as a core. Like for example, you could put new carpet in or new flooring, and you could, um, you know, paint all the walls. And then you could kind of optimize things as things go on, right? So for me, that's kind of what I've done. So uh, when I got mine going again in 2014, um, I got new furniture, pretty much new couches, <laughs> new coffee table, new beds. Uh, and then as time went on, I would repaint all the walls, recarpeted the entire place. Um, I repainted the entire kitchen. One thing that's a nice touch um, that is really not too expensive that does make a difference um, is new kitchen cabinet handles. Um, you know, it's still going to be you know probably a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks, but that is a nice touch that you can do. Obviously, if the place that you got you know needs new toilets, it is what it is. It needs new toilets or you know new bathroom sinks or kitchen sinks. You're going to have to assess what it is that what it is that you need. Um, what I can say is you know obviously the kitchen is going to be a very big. Uh, part of the rental, right? So one thing that is kind of pretty achievable and, and you can find appliances at a reasonably good price, you know, one of the best things you can do is get a nice dishwasher, um, get a nice fridge, um, get a nice oven, and get a nice microwave. I think one thing that I found that's really important is to have a nice dishwasher because if your dishes aren't don't wash properly and they don't come out nice, that's going to be just another thing that, that you know, people can get upset about the fact that you know the dishwasher didn't didn't wash the dishes properly so now that um you know you kind of know what it is that you're going to do with respect to doing some of your um you know your, your renovations or getting the property ready in in terms of the core right that the painting uh the appliances um, carpet that sort of thing it's going to be time to pretty much furnish your rental so this is actually you know can be kind of fun it's super super duper detailed, but um, it, it is obviously a, an extremely important part because you're renting a furnished rental. When it comes to your kitchen, you're going to want to fully stock your kitchen. You know, obviously you're going to want a coffee maker. You're going to want to have a silverware. You're going to have a flatware. You're going to want to have kitchen organizers, kitchen utensils, mixing bowls, uh, plateware, obviously you're going to want to, you know, at least a blender. Uh, Everything you can, you know, you can think of. I also, um, what I'm going to do is in this video, you'll see a link in the description area, and I have a document which actually has all of this, uh, all of these items, you know, for your kitchen, your bedroom that you can actually click and go to, and I'll prepare that for you. Okay. Uh, so for your living area, you're going to obviously want to have a couch or couches, depending on how big it is. You're going to want to have a TV, a smart TV, some sort of a of a streaming device. You're going to, um, you know, want to have some throw blankets, like some sort of blankets that people can use. You're going to want to have some throw pillows as well, some sort of pills they can use, um, and then, you know, possibly some games, right? Some games for, you know, families to play, or, you know, young adults or adults that would just want to play the games, you know, amongst themselves. Um, in terms of the bedrooms, um, each bedroom you're going to, you, you know, you, you want to have a uh, a bed frame, um, bedside tables, a lamp for each side, for each uh, bedside table. Uh, uh, ideally, you want to have a some sort of a chair, some sort of a nice chair, a uh, reasonably nice chair for each bedroom. I would also say you want to use a quilt instead of a comforter. Um, what it's 
that that's an important distinction because what happens is if you use a comforter, uh, that comforter kind of almost has is so big that it has got to be washed in the washer by itself. Whereas if you have a quilt, you can wash a bunch of other things with the quilt. And as time goes on, you're going to see that the amount of time that it takes to to do all the laundry is overwhelming. It is tons and tons of time to do all the laundry. So there's going to be some general home things and and like a supply closet that you want to think about uh, with respect to uh, with respect to your rental. This will be some really basic stuff like a, a broom and a dustpan, step ladder, light bulbs. You're going to want to have shampoo and conditioner and body wash for each bedroom. Uh, and then, you know, for, you know, in the kitchen, you're going to want to have always a, uh, um, you know, a supply of uh, dish packets or, or dishwashing detergent, uh, also laundry detergent and hand soap for the kitchen and then hand soap for each um, for each bedroom. Uh, I believe that as of now, uh, you know, Airbnb requires you as the host to actually have, you know, shampoo and body wash and soaps available to the people. And then of course, uh, trash bags, toilet paper, uh, and paper towels. You also want to have uh, some fake plants at the property. Uh, I mean, real plants is not really a very good idea. You want to have a welcome mat, a first aid kit, and some sort of uh, like a step ladder. Okay, so now for the fun part, let's talk about house technology um, and how it's going to tie in with you going remote. Okay, so uh, in terms of house technology, um, it's really a couple things. I mean, basically, uh, one thing that I found pretty extremely crucial is the Nest thermostat. So what's interesting about the Nest thermostat is you can also get a camera. They make it available. You can actually get a camera and put it inside the Nest thermostat. That way it helps you you know, understand how many people are staying at your place. I mean, you do potentially could run into a situation where you know more people are staying at your place um, than, have, than, 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 than what the proper booking should be, in, in which case you'd have to address it. Uh, the next is actually a smart lock for check-in um, and then a doorbell, a doorbell camera. Um, but again, and you don't, I don't really think you need a doorbell camera and an S, uh, one or the other. One thing that's, uh, I'm actually seeing as well is people are starting, there's certain areas where there's 30 day minimums and a lot of these folks are, you know, and they'll have a house, they'll rent each individual bedroom. <laughs> and in that case, each bedroom actually has a smart lock. But when you have a smart lock, you can actually change the code, you know, for each tenant. So when you have that on the front door, um, you don't, you know, I have kind of used a lockbox for years, but the best scenario is actually having a backup lock box and then and then using a, a Yale Smart Lock um, as your uh, as your lock for the front door so that you can change the code for each new tenant. Have figured out your renovations. You figured out you know how you're going to furnish the place. You've got it furnished. You've got it all dialed in in terms of the furnishings and the prices and all that. The next thing to do is you're going to be setting up your listing. So when it comes to setting up your listing, the first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to research and hire a photographer. So you know the fact that you're going to spend that anybody would spend all this money you know in buying a place and or renting a place and doing all these furnishings and not invest in a professional photographer is actually uh, kind of crazy if you think about it um, what's interesting is back in the day uh, years ago Airbnb used to provide professional photography and they didn't even charge the catch with that was that they the, the, the photos could only be on Airbnb so if you wanted to um, you know shoot what you could do is what I did was I uh, did photos Photos alongside of the professional photographer that they sent out and I actually used a really nice camera at the time and they came out great so that way I could put it on the other sites um, so what you want to do is that of course you want to uh, research and hire a professional photographer in fact you can still do that with Airbnb they do have a section where you can hire a professional photographer and what they do is you don't even have to pay for it they just take it out of your um, out of your earnings with respect to the, the host payouts that they would pay once you figured out your photographer um, and you get that organized now it's going to be time to create your listing. So what you want to do is it's really going to be easiest to choose your first uh, place to put your listing. And, you know, it, it's probably just going to be easiest to do it on Airbnb. So you go on Airbnb and then what you can do is once you have your, um, you know, your photos figured out and up, upload it onto your, your site, your property listing, then you're going to actually do, you're going to, you know, you're going to write your listing, right? Um, and then what you could do is you could pretty much model that on every other site that you use. So you can, you know, copy and paste your listing onto other sites, and then you can kind of organize the photos the way that you have the photos organized, um, and you can put it on other uh, sites the way that you prefer to organize it. What I found is uh, with Airbnb, they have no limit with photos, so I think you can put as many as you want. Uh, 
VRBO does have a limit of 50, and then a lot of other places um, will have a limit for photos. Uh, what I found is with Craigslist, uh, Craigslist has got a limit if you, you know, so choose to, to put your, your listing on Craigslist. Um, they have a limit of 24. Uh, and then, there, you know, all other sites are going to have their own thing. But usually it's about 50 is, is, is the most common limit. that I You're going to want to use the best writing skills that you have and highlighting the area and all the great things about, you know, the amenities and, and everything from the area. Uh, like, for example, for me, it's like a resort area. So there's like a golf club. There's beautiful, you know, views this you know I go into you know deep detail in terms of the writing when writing listing and really capturing everything that I can um, and you can do that too from you know taking a look at your competition and you can you know see how they write about it and then you can do your own twist one thing I'll say is I am actually um, you know starting to work with people a little bit like taking on clients that want to launch one and they just feel like they need some help not really doing a lot of it but doing some of it and uh, one thing that I'm doing for them is uh, helping them write their list the final version of the of the written listing and, and, and kind of doing the final touches on that right okay so here's where things could get interesting um, and this is alternate property websites so I have had you know my places on so many different websites out there and there's a lot of them in this day and age I mean the fact is is you know like I said you know Airbnb and VRBO are pretty much you know Pepsi and Coke Airbnb owns a lot of other sites and VRBO owns a lot of other sites as well but those are that's pretty much Pepsi Coke. Now, having said that, you still can get bookings from other sites. I mean, there was one site I got a booking from. I had to look it up. It was called Wimdo. <laughs> Wimdo. Um, I got a couple of bookings from that. But also um, TripAdvisor uh, and, and Flipkey, and there's just a whole host of others, right? Um, what I uh, can say is that in addition to that, another thing that you can do, which is pretty effective, is you can go to some of the house relocation agencies out there and then you can submit your property to those. So like a really big one is ALE Solutions and then you can go and do research on others like on LinkedIn or other sites and you can you can um, submit your property on those because what, what that is going to do is those particular scenarios are somebody needs to be um, placed into a, a rental and, and they need to go month to month because they're getting their house repaired or something like that. And also there's, there's Craigslist of course, but then there's a whole host of, of, of other sites that you can use. If you want to, um, what you can do is also, I'll put my, you know, some of my, you know, links in here where you can go to my site. You can also, you know, email me, um, if you want to know some of the sites and I'll, re I'll, I'll, uh, provide them to you. Okay. So now that you've got your listing set up, you've got your photos, you hired your professional photographer, you've written your list you gotten your writing skills as good as they can be obviously um, it's time to now set your rates and also to develop your pricing strategy um, the reality is is that there is a group out there um, called price labs which is pretty much it's all automated and you can just go ahead and sign up I think you get a free trial for like 14 days or a month or something like that and you know it's like super fancy schmancy algorithms that will you know figure out that particular area and and what the actual rates are what i can say is <laughs> you really don't have to do that right i mean you can basically just kind of you know look about a month or two ahead of your calendar and you can also go into airbnb airbnb has got smart pricing but the problem with airbnb smart pricing even price labs is a lot of times their prices might be so low that you might not be comfortable with it. I mean, one thing is I'm very, very focused on pricing. I mean, pricing has got to be right. You know, it's got to make money and pricing has got to be right. Um, and it's got to be, you know, competitive and also it has to be um, in line with profitability, right? But basically, I found it's a little easier to kind of like, you know, establish like a Friday, Saturday night rate and then a weekly rate. Um, and then assign like uh, discounts for like a weekly rate and then a monthly rate. Um, that way, it, it, you know, you don't have like, you know, $400 for a Friday night and then $302 for a Saturday night and then all these different, you know, numbers. It's a little easier to just kind of figure out what works for you and then just keep going down 10% and then kind of establishing what would be a floor for you. But in any case, um, it is, could be a lot easier to just go into Price Labs and get an account and have it all automated. That way it would flow through right to your listing. So when it comes to um, your pricing strategy as well, you're going to want to factor in seasonal rates, right? So obviously it depends on where, where your place is. You know, is your rental 
you know, uh, like mine in Southern California or something like Florida uh, or something like a ski resort. It's going to be different all over the map, right? So what I can say is Southern California, you're going to see quite a bit different pricing from, let's say, April to September than you will see from October to uh, April. Some other factors that you want to, that you'll want to consider are going to be uh, your cleaning fee. It's really important that you get your cleaning fee right. You know, you don't want to be kind of like stuck where you're, you know, you advertise an attractive cleaning fee and then you're paying people way more than the cleaning fee and you certainly don't want to be stuck cleaning the place yourself, right? So um, the cleaning fee, you want to figure out if you're going to have a security deposit or not. Um, Airbnb has got a setting for a security deposit, but Airbnb is pretty good with if something happens, um, you can report it and they're pretty good with, with being reimbursed. Um, VRBO is different. VRBO has got a, a, a security deposit feature. Um, you could just take the security deposit or you can actually set um, a certain amount to be held back or they have the insurance, which is $59 for $1,500 in coverage. Um, I've used that over the years because I got tired of, of, you know, talking to people and trying to get their security deposit back in time, which I could, you know, barely ever do. Um, so I just went with the insurance and um, it's actually terrible. So that, the, the, what is it, property damage protection. I can't remember what the name of the insurance company is, but they've got three different levels and the lowest is $59 for 1500 in coverage. And anytime something would happen, like I would never get reimbursed. I mean, the only time I ever saw any reimbursement was uh, somebody messed up the pool and they even there they pay like a, such a low percentage of what you actually ask them. VRBO has got a setting where you can, you know, set a certain amount that they hold back so that if within 14 days after they check out, if you have to charge, they'll charge, they, they'll charge their card. Having said that, it's not a bad idea to get a security deposit. Um, you know, I think, you know, I don't think there's any way that Airbnb would send that to you. Um, and even in this day and age, I don't think the RBO would, but if you get a, um, a booking from another site, um, those other sites, you know, would, would send you a security deposit. And another fee to uh, figure out is called the extra guest fee. And uh, the extra guest fee is, uh, actually something that's pretty important um, and that's where it also factors in with, with getting a bigger place. So if you get a bigger place with a lot of bedrooms, you can get the extra guest fee and that's where there's going to be large groups and then you can kind of say, okay, here's my property maximum and then you have an extra guest fee over that property maximum and that way they can pay for a larger group, you know, to stay for, you know, and a lot of times you'll see that during um, holiday seasons or, or certainly a lot of times in the summer and spring and stuff like that. So the next thing to look at is actually going to be instant book. So both Airbnb and VRBO have instant book. What I can tell you about VRBO is I actually, at the time of this recording, I've never done instant book, but I'm literally on the verge of starting to do it. Um, and the reason for that with respect to VRBO is because you can gain um, access to their Expedia network for people to book your, your property um, on Expedia by uh, having instant book available on your property uh, listing. I've always done the uh, setup where I have 24 hours to to review the, um, you know, to, to view, review the request. The thing that concerns me, especially with VRBO, is, you know, all of a sudden if somebody books two or three nights, six months away, that's exactly what I don't want. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, there are opportunities where people will come to you from Zillow or Facebook Marketplace or something like that, and they need a place and they want to go month to month. Um, and, you know, the insurance company is paying for it. And those are actually really great scenarios. When somebody books your place for like two or three nights and it's months and months away, it prohibits you from, from, from doing those opportunities, which for me has been uh, cumbersome, right? So, but having said that, Gaining access to that Expedia, Expedia network is kind of, in a way, pretty silly to not have it because it's like almost more than double of the actual exposure that your listing will get. Double from VRBO, so meaning like, you know, you'll get way more than double from just than, than what you would just get from VRBO had you not had the instant book on. So in any case, um, uh, my understanding is that it's pretty complicated to actually cancel a reservation after they've done an instant book. So. The difference is that if you do a 24 hour review, you can review the, the, the property booking and then you could decide to accept it or not, you know, but then when it comes to instant book, you have no right to review it. You just basically, the only way to, the only way to have it uh, go away is 
that you ask them to cancel it or you actually cancel it. Um, the problem with those scenarios are if you're rejecting bookings and you're canceling, that negatively affects your hosting, um, you know, your your host performance metrics, both on Airbnb and VRBO. So, you know, with respect to VRBO, at least you can just kind of ask them to kind of cancel it or just ask them to not do it or something like that, or they can retract it. It's pretty easy for them to retract it on, on, on Airbnb on their own. And when they retract thing, you know, the, the requests, it doesn't affect your, your host metrics. So when it comes to ongoing uh, property management, everyone, what I can say is that Google Nest uh, thermostat is really uh, very helpful and crucial. Uh, it certainly has enabled me to go more semi-passively. You always know what the temperature is, so you can see if there's something going on with the HVAC, you know, whether it comes to heating uh, or air conditioning. Um, and then also the Yale Smart Lock. So what's going to happen next is um, you all are going to have to assemble what we call the boots on the ground. So you're going to have to have some boots on the ground people for your rental. So what is that? That's going to be a lot of stuff. So I think to give you an example from my one property about an hour, you know, 20 minutes inland of Los Angeles, you know, I need to have a pool person. Um, which is basically just a pool cleaner that maintains, you know, the pool being clean. Then there's also separately from that, there's a pool maintenance person because that pool cleaner can't always figure out everything related to the equipment, right? Um, then there's a landscaper. Um, then there's going to be a contractor. I've got a contractor. I always talk to him for lots of different things that are going on, whether it's painting or contracting or um, structural work for the deck or, you know, that sort of thing. There's also going to be a landscaper. Landscaper is very important if you have a yard and if you're going to have a pool and a hot tub, obviously you're certainly going to have a yard. But the most important person, uh, a service person of all this is going to be your cleaner. So it's you know going to be really important that you have a really good cleaner and then also that you have some backup. Uh, and then that you, depending on the size of your property, that you know your cleaner actually has backup if they need it um, or if they can't be there that day. So you want to have backup. You're also going to need a handyman, pest control, your general contractor, AC uh, and heating uh, repair people, as well as a plumber. Uh, so again, the most important of all that is going to be your cleaner because your cleaner is going to be in charge of getting the place clean so that when people show up, the place looks as good as it can look. That's always the biggest deal. And especially in this day and age when it's getting, it's gotten so competitive on Airbnb. You also want um, uh, an appliance repair person. So that's kind of more down the line where you've had a rental for a long time and you know, you want to hold on to your appliances, but in general, you're, you know, an appliance repair person, a good appliance repair person is going to be really important because what we found is um, a lot of the older, well not really too old, but uh, appliances made between 2000 and 2005 are actually a lot more reliable than all the digital appliances these days. All right, so from here everybody, you're gonna wanna launch, maintain, and continually optimize. Like I told you, you know, it's just the list of things that you have to do to make a place nicer can just go on and on and on. And for me, I mean, one thing that's kind of worked is to just basically um, to use existing cash flow to make things nicer. Uh, you know, something I found is, uh, you know, getting the right, you know, couch cover, um, you know, couch seat cover and couch pillow cushion covers. Covers is huge. You can take them off. You can wash them. Uh, getting the right dining chair covers. All this stuff you could just keep optimizing. You could keep making appliances nicer. You can keep getting nicer chairs. You can keep getting nicer coffee tables. You can keep getting nicer beds. You're going to have to replace the mattresses every probably, I think, four or five years. Um, you know, it, it's an ongoing thing, and, and, and I keep, you know, doing my best that I can do with respect to, you know, the credit and the money that's available to get nicer towels, to get nicer furniture, to get nicer things for the kitchen, to get a nicer coffee maker. It's an ongoing process. You're going to have to launch, maintain, and keep on optimizing. And you're going to have to, you know, obviously, you know, hire service people when you need stuff addressed. So a few uh, important closing notes that, that we have here are some closing notes on cleaning. Obviously, you know, I can't stress enough cleaning. The cleaners are going to be your most important people. Getting the place as good as can be, as clean as can possibly be for people is just going to be so important. And it's not a regular maid. I mean, it's very important things like, you know, having the kitchen cabinets organized and the kitchen drawers organized. But one of the most important factors for cleaning is going to be factoring in your laundry time. So basically when it comes to having the property, like in my case, it's four bedrooms, but there's also a fifth bedroom and that fifth bedroom has got four beds in it. So this is a lot of laundry. It's a lot of sheet laundry. It's a lot of quilts. It's tons of laundry. All that laundry 
takes a minimum of 12 hours to do. So if you actually factor in like, okay, this cleaners, they have to do all the laundry and then they also have to do all the cleaning, you know, uh, and juggle that laundry when they're doing the cleaning. So doing that laundry is going to be a huge factor in, in, in analyzing and assessing the time required to do that cleaning. So another concern is on screening guests. So as you all may know, uh, Airbnb, I think around the pandemic or, you know, with, I don't know, in the last couple of years, they instituted a no party policy. So people are not supposed to be throwing parties with Airbnb. What I can tell you is even with my rental, I've seen people go to VRBO because they want to have a family party. So you have to watch out for that. So basically, if you're worried about screening guests, what I can say is that in general, Airbnb might be a better um, host platform, might be a better site if you're worried about screening guests. I had a scenario where somebody was foreign, they had no you know, credit that they could see, they wanted to go rent my place for a couple months, and I ultimately decided that I, I had to have them you know, go do it through Airbnb. Um, because Airbnb handles that whole process and the screening process. So if you do have a, a concern um, about screening someone, you can actually do it through Airbnb because they take care of all that. Um, having said that, you know, I would still, <laughs> personally, I would rather do my, my reservations through VRBO. Um, another closing note we have here is going to be providing outstanding customer service. So basically, at some point, you know, again, everybody's going to be different, but if, if you're in a scenario where you're going to be limited by credit and money as you launch and you can't get like super nice everything, you're going to want to provide the absolute best, most outstanding customer service that you can. And all that really is, is just doing whatever you can to, you know, make them feel like they're hurt. Responding quickly is, is, is pretty big, is a pretty big deal. And with both Airbnb and VRBO and the way that they both have mobile apps, it's very easy and convenient to reply to them. Um, as quickly as you can. I found that it goes a long way. Replying to people quickly goes a long way. No matter how bad whatever is going on, something happens, you know, replying quickly uh, goes a long way. Just, you know, anything that you can do to make things better, even if they're complaining or or whatever it is, um, it, it, you know, it, it's going to reflect in, in you know, if they, they leave a review. Um, another item is going to be personalizing, personalizing the experience. So, you know, whatever place that you selected, I mean, like for me, um, my place is at a lake and I really love lakes. So like little things like lake decor or like, like an old water ski, stuff like that. Like well, anything that you can do to personalize the experience in your property um, is going to be nice because it kind of, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different. So people might feel like they're staying at like this kind of you know, cool little. This could also be things like, you know, leaving a wine or a couple bottles of wine or leaving a welcome basket. One thing, one time uh, with me, we actually ended up with all this champagne and wine from some crazy thing, but we had like like a hundred cases and I was leaving wine for people. I mean, this is years ago, but I was leaving wine for people and they loved it. This is back in the day when reviews were, you know, really so it kind of helped me get a good review. Which brings us to the next topic, the next closing topic, which is the reality of, review, of reviews. So, you know, obviously reviews are important um, and it would really, you know, certainly stink to not get a good review. But what I've kind of found is that in this day and age, um, it just kind of is what it is. I mean, if you get a bad review, um, you know, you can recover from it. Um, there's certain, I, I even have uh, some tricks if you're interested uh, in what I've done um, to actually get over some bad reviews. But it just is what it is. And you do have the opportunity both on Airbnb and VRBO to provide as detailed of a response to the review as possible. I personally don't really spend much time on providing a response to a good review. I just will provide a response to a bad review. And in my responses, I attempt to highlight all the different motivations that I've done to the property. And the fact is, if you do get a bad review, what you want to do is you want to focus on, you know, replacing that as quickly as you can with as many good reviews as you can. Okay, so one of the last things is property instructions. So when it comes to property instructions, um, both Airbnb and VRBO, they're going to have their own systems where they send guests out all this different stuff. And you will be able to put, um, you know, all your own items into all the different compartments of VRBO and Airbnb. But for me, I just have a Word document. I keep optimizing that Word document over time. And that's what I do is I send the people the Word document over email. So, you know, I do have parts of that Word document in the property instructions. Um, 
in the various sites of VRBO and Airbnb, but I also have a Word document. And then in addition to that, what I found is I've done videos. So when it comes to the actual pool, providing instructions, I notice a big difference between from written instructions on the pool to video instructions. So the video instructions made a huge difference in terms of you know not as many people reaching out to me with questions on the video instructions. So in any case, um, I've found that's a great way to optimize your time, having those instructions. So regardless of all the different material they get from VRBNB and VRBO, go ahead and send out those instructions, always optimize them and send them via email. So in conclusion, I know it's been a lot of details and I just wanted to provide details and give you the nitty gritty. And I hope that all the details don't deter you away from doing something that you want. In conclusion, what I can say is that, you know, short medium term rentals is one of the fastest ways to frequent and continuing four and five figure deposits. Uh, it has been for me at least, right? And then also another thing is that pretty much anybody can do it. You know, you've got to find sale, you know, service people, you can go to Yelp, you can pretty much find anybody you need on Yelp. Um, the reality is, is it's dependable and it's dependable because people always need a place to stay. Okay, hopefully you guys found this informative. If you have any questions, put some questions in the comment area or I'm gonna put some links that you can see. You can book a call with me if you wanna talk about, you know, some of these clients I'm taking on or I'll put you know my email uh, in the description area. You can email me if you like. I hope you liked it. Uh, I hope it was informative and best of luck to you. All right, take care. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like this content that I put out, uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and click on the alerts bell so you don't miss out on any new content. Um, also, you can click in the description area and you can see different links like social media links uh, and different other links that you can go to where you can um, you know, see about the different uh, services and, and, and products that we have. Also, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like. You can find me at email socalrentalguy at gmail. Okay, thank you and let me know if you have any questions and have a great one. Thank you for watching. If you like our investment content, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel. We're going to come out with videos uh, on everything from investing in really anything, uh, whether that's stock investments or ETFs or real estate investing or even online business. So if you do like what you see, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel and also click the alerts bell so you don't miss out on, out on any new content. You can also click below in the description area and you can see different uh, links and ways that you can uh, get in touch with us uh, and communicate with us. Thank you.